today's top boxing news. Ow! Okay, we'll start with this. In response to Alicia Baumgartner's public announcement, veteran boxing scribe Ryan O'Hara responded to it by saying, I can confirm that Alicia Baumgartner had hair analysis conducted per document I have received. Test was done on October 24th and completed on October 26th, to which Lou DiBellia responded, Congratulations, Ryan. Who the fuck cares? Alicia can't exonerate herself. She's not the judge. The case is open. Christina Lenardatu can't even get confirmation that she had her B sample tested. Michigan has seemingly done nothing. No one has. Steroid regulation in boxing equals a joke. I am a little bit confused by Lou DiBella, his demeanor, his reaction, and what it is exactly he wants because a good number of his own fighters and fighters that he's worked with They've been in the same position as Alicia. Right before Alicia's doping fiasco, one of Lou DiBella's own female fighters, world champion Hannah Gabriels, en route to what was supposed to be the Clarissa Shields fight, she tested positive for a banned substance. Lou DiBella blamed it on dog medication. You can believe that. Before that, Jean Pascal, you know, he tested positive for two or three banned substances, and immediately after that, Lou DiBella, he didn't hesitate to work with him. He didn't stand on principle. And before that, one of his other female fighters some years ago, Heather Hardy, she tested positive for a banned substance. So when Lou DiBella... Well, he said that steroid regulation is a joke. It's a joke in the sport of boxing. So is he advocating for more stringent testing or harsher penalties, harsher punishments for fighters that test positive for banned substances? Because it seems like a good number of fighters he's worked with would be subject to those harsher punishments and those more stringent circumstances. In truth, I don't even get the sense that Lou DiBella... Just call it what it is. He's a hypocrite. They don't keep the same energy for everyone else's fighters that they keep for Matchroom's fighters. Hannah Gabriel's anti-doping fiasco, whatever it was, it didn't get the same coverage, the same attention that Alicia's did, even though Hannah's a champion like Alicia, she's been around a long time, I guess it's not as much fun taking the piss out of Lou DiBella's fighters than it is taking the piss out of Eddie Hearn's fighters, because that's how it looks. I got nothing against Alicia, Hannah, Heather, or Jean Pascal for that matter. It's just that when I see Lou DiBella saying what he's saying and him having worked with who he's worked with, fighters that have found themselves in the exact same situation as Alicia, I don't know what he's advocating for. Harsher punishments because the fighters you've worked with, they would be subject to those harsher punishments. Is that what you want? What is he saying? He's saying that steroid regulation in boxing is a joke. Well, if it is, it's a joke that Lou DiBella's fighters and fighters that he's worked with, it's a joke that they have benefited from. That's how it looks. What happens now? According to Alicia, her independent testing vindicated her and the case is closed as far as she's concerned. Though when it comes to the powers that be, that research is still pending review and we'll see what they decide to do. She deducted, based on her own research, that hair follicle testing is in fact superior to urinalysis when it comes to anti-doping, but because urinalysis is more cost feasible, that is what is uniform in the sport. As you can imagine, these tests are very expensive and you have to find cost effective methods to test on a broad scale, a wide scale, and even with that, anti-doping testing in the sport, it's not where it should be. Nevertheless, urinalysis is said to be inferior to hair follicle testing based on Alicia's research. It just so happens that when Canelo Alvarez, the face of boxing, when he had his own anti-doping fiasco, it was hair follicle testing they used to vindicate him. Seemingly, hair follicle testing was intended to clear his name and to the powers that be it did, but to the cynics and the skeptics, it wasn't enough for them and it still isn't, but it was enough for him to resume his boxing career. So it may yet be enough for Alicia to resume hers. It's a legal matter now. And whatever lab Alicia used to conduct this hair follicle test it has to be an accredited lab, one that's up to scratch with the lab that conducted her initial urinalysis. I mean, at least up to that standard. It's important to note that it was drug-free sport 
that conducted the anti-doping testing here. Not VADA, not USADA, and not WADA, drug-free sport. They do anti-doping testing in organized sports, just not normally in the sport of boxing. This time they did, this time they used them, and whatever lab Alicia used to conduct her own independent research, it's gotta be on par with whatever lab they use for her findings to be admissible to the powers that be. If it is, and she's crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's, she'll get to keep her belts and resume her boxing career as if nothing happened. Though I get the sense that she's not in the clear yet, that this isn't quite over. In men's welterweight and junior middleweight news, Crawford's trainer believes Spence would stop Tim Kazoo. Tim Zoo and I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that for a second. In fact, I've long maintained, before Terrence Crawford laid a glove on Errol Spence Jr., that I didn't actually like Errol's chances at junior middleweight, that I didn't feel at 154 he could be the same guy that he's been at 147. The Dallas native hasn't had a single bout at 154. He also has to prove that he can bounce back from the first defeat of his career. On paper, you could make the argument that Zoo is the best that the junior middleweight division has to offer right now. But with that said, if he matched up with Spence, Brian Bomack Mac McIntyre doesn't give the Aussie a chance in hell. He'll stop Tim Zoo. Bo Mac told Sean Zedel of FightHype.com, Errol would stop Tim Zoo. And once again, I, I don't agree. I think that a lot of Americans, American fighters, American trainers, and American fight fans, they overlook foreigners. They overlook guys that are from other parts of the world because they themselves feel they are the best by default. They think it's the 80s or the 90s or something. And how long have I been telling you this is not your father's era of boxing. America doesn't have all the top fighters. They don't have all the top talent, not anymore. I understand that Brian Bo McIntyre is a great trainer and Terrence Crawford is a special fighter. But we ain't got a C. We ain't got an army of Terrence Crawfords running around here. And if you put that fucking booze hound in the ring with Tim Zoo, Tim puts him in a hospital. He would put Errol Spence Jr. in the hospital. I understand that Terrence Crawford takes care of himself between fights. I understand that Terrence Crawford is actually a lot stronger than he looks. But when you look at how quickly he was able to pile the damage on Errol Spence Jr., Terrence being an older, smaller fighter than Tim Zhu. Just imagine what Tim would do to him. I mean, do you think that Errol Spence Jr. is durable enough to make it at 154? I don't, and I didn't. I didn't wait until Terrence kicked his ass up and down that ring to start saying that either. Some time ago, Brian Castaño versus Errol Spence Jr. was a conversation in passing based on their amateur exploits, their amateur bouts that Brian, he beat him in the amateurs. And I felt that he would beat him in the pros. Not because he beat him in the amateurs, but how they were performing and how things were going at that time. At that time, Errol Spence Jr. was a sparsely active, injury-prone fighter with substance abuse issues. And while he might have been a little bit on the bigger side, as far as welterweights go, at junior middle, he wouldn't be big at all. He'd be small. Brian Castaño, WBO champion at that time, for me and my money, arguably beat Arislandi Lara. And we see how he fared against Brazil's own Patrick Teixeira, who he won the WBO title from. For me and my money, a fight between Brian and Errol at that time favored Brian on the premise that Errol's no defensive wizard. He's got a pretty straightforward approach, fighting out of the southpaw stance, stepping into his jab, looking to mix it up in the pocket and go to the body. If you try that with a naturally bigger, stronger, more durable fighter, it ain't gonna pan out. I mean, it didn't pan out for Errol at 147 with a naturally smaller, older fighter and Terrence Crawford at 154 against the bigger, younger, fresher, more active. I think Bo Mack is a great trainer, but I also think when it comes to Tim Zhu, I think he's being dismissive. I think he's underestimating Tim Zhu and overestimating Errol Spence Jr., which is commonplace amongst Americans whenever a fight involves an American and a foreigner. It's not a true assessment, a true evaluation. Sometimes they're just playing sides. Sometimes they're just taking sides based on who they have more in common with. I would heavily favor Tim Zhu to stop. Errol Spence Jr. And I happen to think that Tim Zhu would have given Crawford a better fight than what Errol gave him. If Tim keeps looking how he's looking on the schedule that he's been on, he's getting better and better 
fight by fight. I would still favor Terence Crawford to beat him. That's just saying that I think Tim has more to give, more to give to the sport of boxing than Errol Spence Jr., a fighter who I long stated was overrated. And that doesn't make him a bad fighter. I don't think he's a bad fighter, just overrated, oh. overhyped. And I think Tim would beat him. I think he'd stop him. Though ultimately, it's not a fight that I expect to see happening. So it's really all just what you do about nothing. What is that? The Ring Magazine is a magazine. Uh, I don't know why media and champions and promoters give any credit to a Ring Magazine belt. It's because they've been around a lot longer than your organization, Mauricio. Which only threatens the credibility of the sport. In what capacity? I am very upset because they just declared a few days ago that the rankings of the organizations are corrupt. And uh, if you touch my WBC, I'm going to fight back. I don't care about the Ring magazine because they are a business. This coming from the president of an organization that is charging consumers $80 for a baseball cap, over a thousand, close to two thousand dollars for a replica. I don't care about the Ring magazine because they are a business. They make money. They are biased. You want to talk about biases? Let's talk about biases. You know, immediately after Deontay Wilder, then WBC champion, lost the title to Tyson Fury, the WBC so decided to rank him as their number one contender. And that didn't seem that bad at the time because, well, Deontay was champion for a while. He defended the title successfully a number of times, so he shouldn't lose too much ground, not straight away. But a year later, when he has the third fight with Fury and loses again, they kept him at number one. They kept him there, even though he lost to Tyson Fury two times in a row, two times back to back. He didn't lose any ground to any of the other ranked contenders in the World Boxing Council's ranked standings. At that point, it just seemed like pure chicanery. The first time I understood, but the second time he lost, he shouldn't have been ranked at number one. And here today, he's still ranked at number one. I mean, if you want to talk about biases, what would you call that? He lost to Fury in early 2020, and you ranked him at number one. Over a year later, he loses to him again and you still keep him at number one. And over a year later, a year after that, fights Robert Hellenius, and in spite of all the other activity in the division and in your rank standings, you still kept him at number one. If that's not a clear and apparent bias, what is? You're telling me that Deontay Wilder has been the WBC's number one contender as of the beginning of 2020, and he's only fought three times in three years. And two of the three were losses, knockout losses. You ordered him to fight former champion Andy Ruiz, and they were unable to reach a deal. And instead of moving down your own rank standings to find someone else, for your number one contender to fight, you decided you're not gonna order any fights. You're not gonna do anything. You're just gonna leave him there at number one, freezing those rank standings, even though those other fighters are paying you. They're paying you sanctioning fees. If that is not a clear and apparent bias, what is? And that's at heavyweight. Let's move down to middleweight. Explain to me again how it's okay for Jermall Charlo to hold your title hostage at middleweight, having not defended it in two and a half years. You say that he's got medical issues, or personal issues, or interpersonal issues that prevent him from competing, but then why didn't you just label him a champion in recess? That's literally what that designation is for. Should the champion be unable to compete due to extenuating circumstances, you can label him a champion in recess, and as soon as he's ready to fight, he can fight for his old belt, and let the belt stay in circulation. You didn't do that. You let him hang on to it for two and a half years without fighting, and even now, you're letting him hang on to it when he's about to fight Jose Benavidez, but not at middleweight. At super middleweight. Do you think any of this has helped the middleweight division along? Any of this has helped the sport of boxing? That that title has been out of circulation for so long? You've got the fucking nerve. You've got some fucking nerve, some audacity 
to accuse Ring Magazine of hurting the credibility of the sport, the integrity of the sport. You've got a champion sitting around holding a belt hostage for two and a half years, and you really can't explain why. Because if it is a medical issue, you're supposed to label the guy a champion in recess, but you didn't want to do that, and people are starting to wonder. Been doing that guy favors a long time. It's almost like somebody's paying you to do that guy favors, and they still are, because his medical issue must have cleared up, whatever it was, he's about to fight. He's about to fight this weekend, but not at middleweight, and you're not putting any pressure on him. You talk about hurting the credibility of the sport, integrity of the sport. Well, when you dilute divisions with designations and extra titles and secondary titles, it really does lessen what it means to be a champion. I mean, thank God that most of those franchise titles and franchise, all that franchise crap, ended up getting phased out. What was the point in that? He wants to get his titties in a twist because the people at Ring Magazine suggested that they're on the take, that they are corrupt. Well, corruption, that seems to be your history. Does the name of Graziano Rochigliani ring a bell? And what you did to that guy? Let me refresh your memory. Way back there in 1998, Roy Jones Jr. decided he wanted to move up in weight and he vacated his WBC title. At which point, Graziano Rochigliani fought for the vacant title and won it. Only so that as soon as Roy decided to come back to the division, they took it from Graziano and gave it back to Roy, even though Graziano had already won it. He filed a lawsuit against the WBC and he won it. The WBC, as a result of that lawsuit, was on the hook $31 million. They out to Graziano Rochigliani, at which point in 2003, after unsuccessful attempts to reach a settlement, they filed Chapter 11, just to stay afloat. That's what your corruption got you before. And it seems like you want to poke the bear now. You're out of control, creating new weight classes and keeping titles out of circulation, so obviously doing special favors to special fighters. You shouldn't even get offended when people suggest that your organization is corrupt. You know it is. We all do. You want we should all play dumb? Act like we can't see it? It's the World Boxing Council hurting the sport's integrity. And they've been doing that a while. They've been doing that a long time. What seems like the family business. Because it is a business to Mauricio. Make no mistake.